Hey, Real Life Church. <laughs> Tim's not quite sure what to make of us right now. <laughs> He's behind the camera, behind the scenes. I want to give a shout out to Tim Smart. Tim Smart. And his anointed Smart. left clicking. Oh, yes. <laughs> He's been left clicking for uh, the recording of our worship weeks. for several weeks. Several weeks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Anyways, we are super stoked to be with you guys again for our next Authentic Community series yes. sermon, church movie video thing. Yes. And uh, it doesn't get any more authentic than this. So let's, we're going to worship together. Let's worship together. Yes. Um, and then Tim's going to be bringing another uh, part of the Authentic Community recipe. We've been adding to the definition week after week. It's starting to get pretty long, but it's very good, the definition of authentic community. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, we love you guys. We miss you guys. Um, but we just hope that you're taking the time right now to lean in yeah. to what God is doing and really yeah. hear and listen for what God is saying. And we are going to pray, and then we're going to worship. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let our praises raise up to you. Let our worship rise up to you. Uh, let it be a pleasant sacrifice and a pleasant smelling incense, as it were, for you to enjoy our voices. Let us sing out loud and proud. Um, I know that this is via video streaming, but don't let that be a deterrent for us, Father God. Let us sing the music. Not just sit and listen and watch and sit back, but let us worship you with our all, with everything that we have this week. Lord, we just pray that. We thank you for the miracles you've performed. We thank you for what you've done in our lives, revealing to us your truth of who you are. Let us be a part of sharing that truth to the world around us, that your church grows bigger and bigger, we pray. And we pray all of this in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let faith arise In spite of what I see, Lord, I faith arise for my champion's not dead he is alive and he already knows my every need surely he will come and rest in me God knows faith arise and see the kingdom come I lift my eyes oh for the battle has been won my God is faithful and every single word he said is true
nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. You're the God of
surrounded by or the circumstances that we are surrounded by or the situations and the stuff that is all encompassing and seeming to be just surrounding us. Don't let us give into that. Let our hope and our salvation be in Christ alone, Father. Let us look to you this morning at this time. Father, you and only you we desire to hear from you and only you. We desire to have this relationship and this time with right now, Father. And then let that spread into the relationships with the people around us and our microchurch gatherings and in the church and the whole body of the church. Let it spread out that, that putting our hope and our salvation in you alone feeds the body and helps us to grow healthier and mightier and to work better to your will, Father, and your will alone. We pray in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. Enjoy the uh, message, church. Peace. Well, hey, good morning, Real Life. How you doing out there in micro church land? It's been good to be together in these smaller groups. I'm getting word back from different leaders. Um, just how God is meeting us uh, across the boards in each group. God is showing up in special ways. People are opening up to each other. Relationships are forming that weren't there before. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a real value that we can add to each other as we, uh, as we share what we know about the Father and, and share his, the, the special relationship we have with him uh, and pray for each other and, and, and be there for each other. We are really building ourselves up in love into Christ who is the head. Amen. So we're going to get right back into our authentic community uh, series. We're going to talk about humility today and this is I think the sixth week, so we've literally had five weeks, it's been over a month, and God is just 
just hammering away at us. I think he's trying to say something here uh, about how we need to move into the future where uh, microchurch is just a regular part of what we do. We have the big gatherings, and then during the week we have little gatherings, but sharing our lives together is really what Jesus envisioned, I think, when he, when he saw a picture of the church he would build. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace poured out to us. Uh, even in this very moment, as we're, we're able to gather together, we're able to worship you, Father. And now, uh, Holy Spirit, would you speak your word to us, Lord? I pray just for the, just the, the, the surgeon's scalpel of your word, just to, to work in our hearts, do open heart surgery on us. Uh, we pray, Lord, make yourself known to us through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Men and amen. So, hey, authentic community, I'll hit you with the definition right out of the shoots. We've been talking about this. Um, it actually hasn't been getting longer, got longer one week, and then we just are sticking with it. Authentic community is the supernatural togetherness of a group of Jesus followers caused by the Holy Spirit's work in them to produce unconditional love for each other. So the Holy Spirit is working in us. This big group of uh, Jesus followers called Real Life, and he's working in us, and he's bringing us together, and he's producing his unconditional love for us. He's working it in us for each other. And so all of a sudden, you got this new thing that's happening. You have the family of God. You have the body of Christ and, and you, have, uh, you have the church, you have the called out assembly, the ecclesia, the church. And uh, only God can do that. You know, as a leader, I try to want, I want to see those things happen. I try to do whatever I can. But if I was successful in any kind of way, it would be because of the Holy Spirit and what he's doing. And, and we're just lining up with that and keeping in step with him. And uh, so this morning... Authentic community. What makes it authentic? It's authentic when it's of undisputed origin. We've been saying that here and there from time to time, but basically something is real if we know where it came from. So if you have a, one of those watches you buy on the streets of New York and it says it's some kind of expensive watch, but we don't really know where it came from. We don't know if it's real or not. And, and I bought one of those once and it was a, only a few days and one of the hands fell off and the, the latch breaks, and I say, I, I don't think this is uh, real. I think there's a dispute in the origin of this watch. I don't think it's authentic at all. Well, with our community uh, of following Jesus, this authentic community that, that he's doing, we know the origin of it is the heart of God. How can we know that? Well, because we see his unconditional love um, being formed in us. So, so it's coming from the love of Jesus. You know, Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. You also should love each other. And then he pours out his spirit to actually make it possible because we can't do it on our own. We need the power of God moving in our lives, moving in our hearts to, to produce that, that love that he has and uh, in the process of, of that, he refines us along the way, and he weeds out some things to make way for some better things to grow. And we're going to talk about that this morning. One of those things, he weeds out pride to make room for humility. Humility, being humble, it's basically just the absence of pride. It's, it's um, having a realistic view of ourselves and, and not thinking we're something more than we are and and having a realistic view of the other person and realizing they're just as valuable as we are, is humility. And so um, 1 Corinthians 13, we've been looking at the, the love, the definition of love, how love is put on display in 1 uh, Corinthians 13, and we're seeing different things, and I want you to listen carefully and see if you don't find humility in this, okay? And, and that's to say you will find humility in this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Now imagine uh, 
two guys walk into a restaurant and sit at separate tables. One of them is Mr. Proud, and one of them is Mr. Humble, Mr. Humility. And Mr. Proud is arrogant and full of himself and just full of pride. And, and Mr. Humble is like Jesus, okay? Now, uh, see which one you think this is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. Now, th those, are, those are things that sound like humility to me. Mr. Humble would be that way. Mr. Proud, is gonna, he's not going to be patient with his waiter. He's not going to be kind. He's, he, you know, if he looks around and sees something or somebody, you know, he might be envious. He's probably going to boast and, and be a little braggadocious. Mr. Humble, who has the character of Christ in him, is not going to be that way. It is not proud. I mean, that's obvious. It's, if it's not proud, what is it? It's humble. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. You know, pride is seeking after what's good for myself. I'm looking out for myself. Humility is looking out for others, okay? So it's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. It takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So I think it's not really a stretch. When it says love, uh, love is not proud, well, then what is it? It's humble. And, of course, Jesus himself, he showed us the love of the Father, and he came as a humble king. He came as a servant, and we'll see that in just a second. So, so the love that God produces in us produces humility. If you have that definition of love, if you have that unconditional love that we're seeing in 1 Corinthians 13, it's, you could just as easily say, it's humble. Love is humble, and it would almost cover a lot of those things. Love is not proud, it is humble. And the love that God is producing in us is a humble love. It's a humility like Christ had. Really, it's, it's the love of Jesus being shed abroad in us. So 1 Philippians 2, 1 through 5, Paul knows that if the love of God is operational in the church, there's going to be plenty of humility. There's going to be plenty of, of love on display as humility serving others in that really uh, whether a church or a person, you know, a community is walking in pride or whether they're walking in humility is going to determine their unity. Are they going to stick together? Are they going to walk together? Jordan's going to talk a lot more about unity next week, and I can't wait for that. Um, I'm going to be in Vermont, so I might have a little trouble downloading it, but I'll try to catch that message, or I'll catch up when I get back. And uh, But in Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 5, Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and he's writing something to him very specific. And he could say, hey, hey, Walk in love, love each other. It's not as patient, it's kind, it does all these things. And this big explanation, he narrows it down to one thing, humility. Now, I want, to, I want you to see it because he kind of gives a, a pretty simple working definition we can use too. Uh, sec, uh, Philippians 2 verses 1 through 5 says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So you can hear that description there. He's saying, like, have the same mind, have the same love. This sounds like unity, doesn't it? Like, we're on the same page. Uh, being in full accord and of one mind. The New American Standard Bible says, uh, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. I mean, that is the unity of the authentic community, which is coming together in unity. You know, the authentic community that Jesus is building. And Paul's saying, you got to have that. Like, this is what it is. But then he shows them how. Verse 3. This is a big deal. Because Paul is writing from prison. He's writing from prison. And as he's imprisoned, he has this concern for the communities 
the Jesus communities that he's planted in different parts of the world. And so he's not wasting letters. He's not wasting words. He's not wasting ink and paper. He's getting to the heart of the matter. And uh, he's, he says right here in verse 3, this is really what it boils down to if you want to experience the unity that only the Holy Spirit can do by producing his love in you. This is what you're going to need to do. This is what it's going to look like. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You hear that? I mean, it couldn't be more plain. Do nothing. Zero. Whatever you do, let nothing of it, none of it, nothing that happens in the church, nothing that happens in your community, nothing that happens in your relationship should be coming from a place of selfish ambition or conceit, which is pride. Pride is disgusting. We know this. Pride is, is, is just a stench in the nostril of God, and it's really a stench in our nose, right? If you meet somebody that's prideful, you know, if you're working with somebody that's Humble versus somebody that's proud. Which are you rather? Which would you rather be around? It's simple. We want to be around people who are humble. He says, "Do nothing out of pride, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, and look after their interests just as much as you look after your own." That's the recipe. He gives, again, the recipe for authentic community, but he boils it down to this. Pride's got to go. Pride has got to leave. And in its place, let the humility of Christ grow up, kind of out of the garden of your heart, of of your life. Pull out those weeds of pride and and let the good things that God is doing, let him water it by his spirit, that the soil of your heart would produce humility, in love, in acts of service. So let's see if we can follow this logic, okay? I'm just going to go bump, ba-dump, ba-dump, ba-bam, and the message will be over. So watch. It says, uh, the humility that love produces in us produces the you-first mindset. So we see, we see that... Um, The love that God produces in us produces humility. And then the humility that love produces in us produces a you-first mindset. Sounds like a lot of producing. Well, really, God's working his love in us. The end result is humility. The end result of that is that we serve each other. The end result of the body of Christ serving each other is that we are built up into the image of Christ, the fullness, the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's Ephesians 4, um, like 11 in the following verses. It's like when everybody is serving each other, we're built up into him who is the head, which means we're going to grow in our love. We're going to grow in our authenticity. We're going to grow in humility. It's almost like a circular thing. And and humility is, is in a lot of ways like, I don't want to say necessarily the hub and the wheel, but man, it's central. Like you can, you can know where it's at in almost any situation in your life. When you look back and was I right, was I wrong, what just happened? You, Holy Spirit, show me right now. Was I, was I walking in pride? Was what went wrong back there just pride in me? Or was I, was I walking in humility? Because that's what it boils down to. I mean... In almost every situation of of pastoral counseling with people, I can just kind of be like, hey, it's simple. We're supposed to be like Jesus. I don't care that what they said to you. Oh, I had to set them straight. It's like, no, 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 no. Love your enemies. Jesus calls us to walk in humility. Turn the other cheek. I mean, this, this touches every aspect of our relationships with each other. And it's really like, which father are you of? Are you of your father, the devil, who was the father of lies and the original, uh, the originator of pride and rebellion against God? He believed his own lie that he could somehow exalt himself above God? I mean, what a delusional nut job. 
I almost said nutbag, nut job, not delusional. Let's listen, here's the simple thing. The devil is the father of pride. There was no pride before his sin, his fall, his rebellion, and he brought it into the human race, and it's like his most precious achievement if he can get his children to walk in pride, in arrogance. He knows that if he can get pride to grow in us, he can tear the whole thing apart. It's that simple. So if the Holy Spirit's producing his love in us, it's producing humility in us, well then it kind of begs the question, what does humility produce? Like, let's follow this whole thing out, right? In Philippians 2, 6 through 10, if we keep reading it, we're going to see uh, what humility produces. But first, let me just make sure we get this clear. Humility produces a you-first mindset. So, so when he says in Philippians 2, 1 through 5, uh, complete my joy, having the same mind, having the same love, all this, that, and the other thing. He says, do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. What is that? That's you first. If you want to just get it simplified, humility produces, he said, have this mind which is in Christ Jesus, you first. And Jesus lived it out. So humility, the humility that love produces in us produces the you first mindset. So what does the you first mindset produce? I had that a little out of order, but we're going to be fine. Philippians 2, 6 through 10. As God's love works in our lives, it expresses as humility. Humility expresses as a mindset that puts others first. Like, this is my mindset. I have the mind of Christ, and, and I want to see you do well. I want to see you be blessed. I want to see you flourish, and, and I'm going to use my gifts to, to serve you. That's pretty much what it boils down to. Philippians 2, 6 through 10, is picking up where we left off and carrying it forward. He says, Verse 5, actually. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who though, here's the mindset of Christ. Okay, here's the you first mindset in Christ Jesus. Watch how he walks this out. Watch how he shows us how this works. Verse 6. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't try to hang on to his God qualities, his, his um, equality with God. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now watch this. What, how, what, did, what, what did that just say? Jesus in leaving his place in heaven. He didn't try to hold on to that in pride. There was no pride in him. He emptied himself of all of that glory and he came down and he became a man, like the God man, fully God, fully man. And yet in order to do that, he had to just kind of leave some things aside and just become obedient to the Father and trust the Father and, and uh, enter into our weakness and all of that sort of thing. And he took the form of a servant, the king of heaven, puts aside his glory and, be, and puts on flesh and becomes a servant. And he came to serve us. That's the mindset. That's the you first mindset. He became a servant. He humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He laid down his life for us. That's what it looks like. I mean, that's what a servant does. In the uh, Last Supper, John chapter 13, Jesus gets up from the dinner or the supper, and he, uh, 
It says he t- took off his robe. He had a, a pretty decent robe that the Romans uh, cast lots and, and gambled for in order to, to take it because it had value. He had a pretty decent robe, an outer robe. He took it off. He wrapped a towel around his waist. This was a, to show that he was taking the position of servant, and he got low, and he washed the feet. He did the work of a servant. He served his disciples, and he said to them, Hey, 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 do you know what I've done? You know, a servant is not greater than their master. A student is not greater than their teacher. If I have washed your feet, you also should wash each other's feet. Jesus showed that humility, that you first mindset is going to express itself in serving each other. I mean, that is what binds together and puts love into action in the authentic community that God is working in us is serving each other. What do you need? What is best for you? I have gifts. I have gifts. God has gifted me. God has gifted you. We all have different gifts. But, but in humility, we use them to serve. And the whole thing, the whole body of Christ builds itself up. So I'm going to just kind of wrap this up with you guys. See if we can follow this logic. I had it kind of bungled up in here, but we'll be fine, right? The love that God produces in us produces humility. Love produces humility. The humility that love produces in us produces a you-first mindset. So humility produces you-first mindset. The you-first mindset that humility produces in us produces servanthood and Serving each other is how we grow up in Jesus. It produces the character and the love and the humility of Christ. All the fruits of the Spirit is produced in our lives when we serve each other. And I need you to serve me that way. And you need me to serve you that way. And it's the way it's designed. I think we're going to hear a lot more about this next week. So really quick. If we're going to grow in Christ-likeness, grow in community, grow in our relationships with God and others, what do we need to do? If humility is such a key, what do we need to do? This is, this is, um, we should play the Jeopardy music. This is like kind of simple. We should humble ourselves. We should humble ourselves. Why? Because that's what he says. He says, humble yourself. James 4, 6 through 10 uh, says, but he gives us more grace That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Some translations say, give grace to the humble. So if you're humble, his grace is going to flow into your life. If you're proud, he's going to oppose you. If God opposes you, forget about it. But look at verse 10. If we jump down, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We humble ourselves. God doesn't humble us. I've heard, I've heard that said, and I've said it, and I think that, and it's it, not to get too technical, but he arranges the situations around us to, to give us an opportunity to humble ourselves. He'll bring us to a place where we have a choice. Harden your heart in pride, shake your fist at him, or humble yourself. Brothers and sisters, I, I just want to pray for his grace to flow into your life as you... As you begin to humble yourself more and more, more of his grace flows into your life. More of the character of Christ comes out of you. And it expresses itself in serving. Super quick, as we close. You're like, I've heard that before. No, for real. As we close, I'm closing. I promise. I'm serving you by being short. Here's the thing I want to get. This is where we cut to the quick, okay? Okay. It says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. In the very presence of God, before the Lord, humble yourself. This is what cuts through the bull in the community, the Jesus community, the the authentic community, because we're smart enough to act humble but not be humble. We're, We're smart enough to speak with humility when it serves us, when it gets me first to advance 
because we just know how to play the game. And I've seen it. I've worked with people. I've seen them say all of this, the right things, but I didn't see them serve. I didn't see the heart of a servant. I saw them act humble in order to, to, to gain position and gain influence and get what they want. It was an act. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and, and repent and we'll stone you? Um, but here's the thing. I had to wait and watch for the actions. Do I see true servanthood? No. No, I didn't. And I knew then and there that, that the, the false humility was really pride. It was really advancing an agenda. But God looks at the heart. You can fake it till you make it, but God looks right through and he looks at your heart and he's looking to see humility. And when he sees pride, he graciously brings conviction and we repent. We hit our knees. We, we, we humble ourselves before him. What does he do? He lifts us up. I got to read this. I, I, I promise this is it right here. Watch this. Verse 8, Philippians 2, verse 8. And being found in the human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now watch this, verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the mighty name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He will lift you up. He will raise you up. He wants to, he wants to say, he wants to exalt the humble. And the only way to do that is to humble yourself. And he looks at our hearts, so don't play games. Don't play games in, in micro church as we share. Don't try to hide. Don't try to cover things up. Don't play games with God. He sees your heart. And guess what? Sometimes he lets leaders see too. So I'm just saying, I'm watching you. <laughs> Joke. So here, let me pray for us. I'm going to give us study questions and we're out. Father God, whew, I pray, Lord, that you speak to our hearts. We all walk in a measure of pride. Your grace has been good in our lives. You've worked in us. We're not where we used to be. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm not where I used to be. But, Lord, I know there's more work to do, so I just pray, Holy Spirit, be real, be brutal, be honest, show us ourselves. Bring us to a place where we have a choice to humble ourselves or to harden in pride. And, Lord, let your grace flow into our lives through our brothers and sisters uh, through this community, through your word, by your presence in our lives, that we could uh, choose to repent and choose to walk in humility because it's so important. We just pray you do it, Father. We, we, don't, we don't, even in a word like this, we don't try to, we don't rely at all, zero. I rely zero on my, my, my ability to do it. But your grace is there. You meet us there and you will work it in us because you want to work it through us. And we've seen it happening so far. So please, Father, continue, continue it. Your word says, he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we look forward to that day when we see you face to face and it's almost like we're looking in a mirror because we are in glory with you and all the old has passed away thank you father i, I just want to see it happen Whew. okay study questions if he answers that prayer in your life i'm tr trust me you're going to be on a path to better relationships to authentic community to growing up in him because humility matters so much and now i have to stop i'm the humblest pastor i'm going to stop preaching <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to get that one in. So study questions. Number one, Pastor Tim made a pretty big deal about the importance of humility in the life of a Jesus follower. Do you agree? You know, it's okay to not agree. If you, if you think something different, like bring it out. Um, 
In your experience, how important is getting rid of pride to walking in relationships? This is where some of the older brothers and sisters in Christ can really serve the younger ones by, by opening up their life a little bit. Number two, have you ever struggled to get along with another person in your life? I think I know the answer to that. What role do you think pride played in each of you? How much of a role did pride play in you? How much of a role did pride play in the other? Let's not expose people. Don't be naming names and stuff like that. Be kind and humble. How would being humble have changed things? So I want to look at some things, some relationships. Ver, uh, number three, on a scale of one to ten, this is fun. This is going to be the fun one. Let's have fun with this. Let's be real. Let's be honest. On a scale of one to ten, how prideful have you been in the past? Okay, maybe the past week. Maybe we'll go back further, whatever. On a scale of one to ten, how humble do you think you are? So I think you do the math. If I'm a seven in pride, then I'm probably a three in humility. I'll just let you in on that a little bit. They, they really shift together. Is there any particular area, any particular way or area in which you feel the Holy Spirit challenging you to ditch pride in favor of humility? Unpack that with your microchurch. And then last but not least, if you get this far, number four, you can read James Four, one through ten, what are some ways that we can humble ourselves before God? What are some ways we can live out that humility in serving others? Guys, if you'll wrestle with this, I promise it will be very, very fruitful in your life, in this community, in relationships. Microchurch leaders, um, you probably can't get through all those questions because there was like three questions under each one. Just do your best. Go where the Holy Spirit leads you and be blessed. I'll see you around. We'll see you next time. I'll be Pastor Jordan, and I can't wait to hear what that word is. He'll fix all of my uh, inaccuracies and put a bow on it. <laughs> so blessings to you. Peace.